Good afternoon, everybody. And this is the part that I hope it's going well. And I hope we're actually live streaming to everybody and coming to the multiple channels. Uh, so welcome to the proactive risk management for the C-suite monthly series. I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm a vice president, business development executive from Assured Partners. We work with management teams across the country. We're looking at increased cash flow, reduce volatility, and ultimately get more control over their company's insurance and employee benefits. A few thoughts on technology. Given the significance of, of the topic today and the panelists lined up to speak, it is possible some of you might experience intermittent video or audio issues. This generally only lasts a minute or two and is most often related to your local internet speed. Just sit tight as it usually passes. Also, if you're having audio issues, you may want to consider switching from computer audio to telephone or vice versa. Looking ahead, we will have time near the end of the program for questions. When appropriate, please type in your questions in the question area of the chat panel. We may not have time to get to all questions, but we will look at the questions after the presentation and provide responses to the attendees. This webinar is being recorded today and will be available for replay. Lastly, if something we've discussed today intrigues you or you want to schedule some time to go over additional questions or dive deeper into the topic, absolutely reach out to me via email, call my cell phone, or send me a direct message on LinkedIn. As I mentioned to Jeff and Joe, our panelists today, prior to today's webinar, I would love to generate discussion and thought leadership from today's topic and welcome any additional conversation. So let's introduce our two panelists who I've already kind of mentioned. Today, coming from the Mountaineer State of West Virginia, we have the Head of Employee Benefits from our Captives Vertical here at Assured Partners, Jeff Christian, and hailing from Itasca, Illinois. By the way, that's my Keith Jackson impression right there. We've got Joe Perilli, Senior Vice President from Captive Resources. Why don't you two briefly introduce yourselves? Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, got it. Thanks. Great to be with you, Chris. I think it's a, a timely topic. Um, I definitely think it's something that the C-suite um, uh, is paying attention to, and, and I appreciate you letting me join you today to, to share some of our thoughts and opinions. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I, I echo Jeff's comments, obviously, Chris, thanks for setting this up. And I hope it's valuable to, to everybody on the phone or on the internet. Uh, real quick, just from my perspective, been here at Captive Resources now for 10 years. I've seen a little bit of everything from the health insurance side. So I started uh, when employee benefits captives or medical stop loss captives weren't as much of, of a buzzword as they are now. And as they've grown in the marketplace, uh, Captive Resources has grown grown with them. So excited to talk about this topic. I now uh, lead our entire medical stop loss division here, which we'll get into as we go through this. Yeah, and, and Chris, maybe I should add on to that. <laughs> I should give a little bit more of my background maybe. So um, 24 years in the employee benefits arena with Assured Partners, again, out of Charleston, West Virginia, and the last 10 years, um, been focusing on employee benefits captives. So uh, one of the things that we do at Assured Partners, and I think we do very well, is that um, we have specialty units. And um, those specialty units are developed to support our business across the country, um, designing new programs, helping, helping our clients and our prospects understand employee benefit captives. And Joe, to your point, um, yeah, was in it before it was a buzzword, right? And yeah. it, in it when everybody thought employee benefit captives were like a mythical unicorn, right? And um, a lot of people don't realize how long that they've been around. Um, and now, obviously, I think, you know, one of the reasons that I got into this 10 years ago is that, you know, just the struggles I've seen my current clients and prospects and the, and the difficulties and challenges they've brought to the table to me and just trying to find a better way. I think where you know, 10 years ago where I was focusing on business is just the challenges of lack of providers and transparency and just uh, medical inflation and increased costs. And every market's different, right? 
And the interesting part, what I've seen about captives and, and why I've kind of I've entered this position with Assured Partners is that um, it's it's kind of like a wave, right? It's built up in some areas faster. Yeah. Uh, and I think because of pressure in some areas, not as much, but it's it's definitely spreading. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very timely topic. And and I think that, Chris, you would know that both Joe and I, it's, it's what we do every day. And, and it, it definitely keeps us busy for sure. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you kind of came back in, Jeff, to talk a little bit about yourself and talk about Assured Partners because I was going to to probably start talking you up and letting everybody know kind of who the real Jeff Christian is. Uh, so I'm glad you kind of, you know, brought that to the forefront. Uh, so again, our topic today is medical stop loss group captives, right? And, and as you guys alluded to now more than ever, CEOs, CFOs, leaders of, of human resources and, and business owners need innovative solutions to be proactive when it comes to one of the largest and fastest growing light items on any company's balance sheet, right? And that's what everyone calls health insurance. Okay. So without going too much further into the topic, I'm going to have you guys kind of take the take the lead here and uh, we're going to dive into it. But what I want to do just for the folks that haven't been doing it as long as you guys have and, and really aren't up to speed, right? I want to just kind of dive in and, and just talk about kind of captives 101 to start, right? Give a quick overview and then kind of break down a little bit you know, what is a what is a member owned group captive? So, so Joe, why don't you just kind of kick us off a little bit and just talk about, you know, captives 101 and then break off into kind of group captives. Yeah. So a, a captive really at, at the highest level is the bringing together of, of companies to form a reinsurance company. And what the captive is responsible for doing is taking a layer of risk away from, from the stop loss vendors we know in the market, a Sun Life, an HCC, a Berkeley. So truly it's acting, I like to call it, in somewhat of an upside down reinsurance mechanism. The captive's taking a defined layer of risk. Um, captives aren't new, Chris, as you said, right? Uh, the single parent captives have really been around for 50 plus, maybe even 60 plus years, if not dating back even further. You know, group captives really came to light 40 years ago, more so on the casualty side, work comp, GL, auto. And as we've said, over the last 10 years have really evolved on, on the medical side. When you start getting into the idea of being member owned, that's really where captive resources comes in from the consulting perspective. We don't operate as brokers, right? We, we don't want to play that role. That's why we partner with folks like yourselves. Uh, we want to be the ones there educating on what the group captive idea is, how it works, and truly what it means to be an owner of that, of that reinsurance company. When groups join a member-owned group captive, they, they truly become an owner. They are making the decisions a captive resources or any other captive consultant is just there helping them steer their insurance company forward. We don't have an ownership stake. We don't uh, make decisions on behalf of the captive. It's about educating the members, bringing the information to them and letting them make a decision based on all of the information. So that member own piece in my mind is a big piece of what makes group captives just in general, very successful. And, and Jeff, any any follow on thoughts to kind of what Joe just said right yeah, there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important what Joe's saying is that they're a program manager, right? And and what's important about that is, you know, they are not owners um, and they manage specifically multiple captive cells. I think what's important is I think sometimes we don't speak highly enough about having a solid program manager around captives because it's really the one that's kind of keeping everyone moving in the right direction and doing things behind the scenes to make sure that things run effectively and efficient efficiently which means that a well-run captive is going to is going to grow right i mean that's the idea of it it's going to grow and it's also going to become you know more efficient and and its performance is going to be better the interesting part about the member owned is that I think that when we're introducing new clients or new prospects to this concept is, um, you know, you can explain to them, you're putting them in a room with like minded individuals and that's important, right? You're putting everybody. It's kind of like, think about you just put a filter 
on everyone that's buying employee benefits and you're putting people in the room that are engaged, right? And they're all working towards a better, a cleaner pool or or they're just working for better performance. And Chris, you said it best. I mean, I would argue to say that most companies employee benefits spend is number two right behind payroll, right? So it's not going anywhere. It's going to be blaring. Um, but you know, when you explain that you're putting people in a room and they're having real discussions about challenges that are facing them and how, um, and I, I love it when I go with my members to some of these meetings and I just sit back and listen uh, and listen to everybody share about how they're tackling these issues. But I think it's important that the program manager piece um, and how it, it supports the members of that captive and how it helps facilitate meaningful conversation, which for the group is better. And I, th I think it's important too. Jeff, Jeff said like-minded a few times, which in my experience can sometimes get confusing, right? Some people think like-minded, we're all in, we're all truckers or we all do the same thing in an industry. Right. And that's not the case. Um, if you look at the makeup of, of most health captives, it's heterogeneous in nature. When we say like-minded and Jeff, I'm assuming this is what you mean too, it's people who want to get away from the status quo mm -hmm. trying to buy insurance off a spreadsheet and move deductibles around and put more onus on the employees and their families and really find a way to gain that element of control, right? And that's the like-minded nature of folks who decide to become owners of a reinsurance company. They just want to do it different and they need to do it different because not only is medical spend probably number two on the P&L, if you look at studies, especially with a younger workforce coming out, it's what people are asking about related to packages that they're gonna receive. It's about retaining and gaining new talent. And as you look in over a long period of time, if you've moved deductibles or, or manipulated the plan to make it more affordable, but taken those benefits away, that becomes a struggle on the other side as well. So that's really, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in, right? That's really what people come into a room and want to discuss and share and learn about because they're seeing the migration of people and they want to find ways to keep that talent. Yeah, and just, you know, a couple of things as I'm listening to both both Jeff and, and Joe here talk, you know, a couple of thoughts kind of really came to mind or some themes is, you know, uh, I always think of, of you know, best in class, right? You've, you've got companies with great management teams that are, are looking to take over control of, 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 of what they can within their balance sheet. And they're also looking at two, five, and 10 years. Okay. They're not looking at it from a transactional basis. They're looking at it from a, a part of their processes within their company. And, and going back to when Joe um, was talking about, you know, the captive management, it's, it's really a relationship that's more aligned with the end user, the company, right? They have the same goals and values, and they're looking to get to the same objectives versus being on the opposite sides of the table. So I just kind of want to throw that out there to everybody listening. It's a much different dynamic uh, on several fronts. Now, we kind of jumped ahead a little bit, and, and which is a good thing, but, you know, a lot of time in the group captives world, right, we've got, you know, homogeneous and, and heterogeneous in the medical stop loss world, for the most part, everything is going to be uh, heterogeneous. Is that correct, Joe? I have seen some homogeneous medical captives set up for maybe schools or uh, care facilities, things like that. The way we've always approached it here at Captive Resources is we want the best of the best risk based on how the captives are set up. So we're looking at risk profile, not necessarily industry. Yep. Uh, what I've always said is anybody's wife can go and have a premature baby. Anybody's spouse can go and have a surgery. Right? Mm -hmm. I, it doesn't matter if you work in a school or you work here at Captive Resources. So I think it's important to find the best risk to continue that growth and that spread of risk in the program, not necessarily be industry focused like it may be when you're looking at work comp, GL, and auto on the casualty side. Right. right. Yeah, and what's interesting about that, too, is I think that, you know, we talk about heterogeneous, and by no, by all means, it's, it's typically heterogeneous, but Joe's right. Claims come from everywhere, right? It's really what you're looking for is, um, I always like to say, we like to see the businesses 
and have a conversation with them about a success they've had in their own business when they've focused on a problem and they've solved it. And a lot of the times, and, and you know, I point to, to the other side of captive resources business on the casualty side, you know, I ask these clients, do you have a safety program? And they're like, well, yeah. And then and we have a meeting every week and we have a roundabout and we talk about issues and we talk about what we're doing and we're going to manage that. So we stay competitive. And I said, just, it's amazing how many times I make this comment. I said, imagine if you t- took uh, the, a similar focus to that forum right there into your employee benefits and you identified ways to improve your risk. It's, it's all about improving risk, whether it be your casualty side or your employee benefit side. So, you know, taking that view is um, very, very important. But ultimately what I find is that we'll have a, uh, a client move into a captive and then they're calling all their friends, right? And they're in the same industry. Right. So the other thing that I'm seeing too, is I'm starting to see where some of these, I call them hardened markets across the country where for whatever it may be, I mean, obviously there's a lot of consolidation going on with healthcare providers today. That's a challenge. You know, we've got, you know, it's it's a multiple moving problem, but some of these markets are a little bit tougher in my, and in my you know, backyard, that's what I was experiencing. You know, we haven't seen a lot of population group in the, and you know, you want to call it the Ohio Valley or you want to call it the Appalachian region of, of where we are. We haven't seen that population growth. Um, we have, we're, we're typically older as compared to other states, right? So what I had is I had high performing groups that needed a place they could spread their wings a little bit more, where they could truly get a return on that change that they were making. So, um, it, it, it's a, it's a real interesting conversation when you really start talking about industries and geography and it, every place is going to be different, right? I can't tell you that there's one Mecca for employee benefit captives, right? There's not like one area like Silicon Valley, right? It's, it's the, or New York for financial or Charlotte. It, it's not that it's, it's really more, um, it's really more about the, the the current challenges that are in that marketplace or, you know, the individual views of the owners or, or shareholders of the companies. Well, and Jeff, that, just to echo and, and elaborate on one point, you know, when you go into the companies you have from the safety side, you clearly have buy in top down, right? It's not yep. starting necessarily with a safety manager on the line. It's coming from the top, the CEO, the president, whoever it is. And I think what I've seen is there's been a misconception about the health insurance side and and what wellness is and how invasive it needs to be that sometimes folks have hesitated to get that involved as they do on the safety side. But I think what, what our members have learned is wellness is this massive umbrella that everything falls underneath. And it doesn't just have to be go get your blood drawn, go do healthy eating out of the vending machines. I mean, yeah, that's a strategy. That strategy works for folks, but it doesn't work for a lot of the population. So underneath that umbrella comes into plan design recreation, what you're doing with drugs. Um, Do you have carve outs? I mean, there's so many things that people have just been afraid of from the term wellness that truly isn't. The, the purview that maybe the captive members come in and share and learn and then have the ability to go and have that top-down approach. And yeah, some may do walking challenges, but that's not really where wellness stops anymore, where maybe 10 years ago, you didn't have that much structure underneath that umbrella. You know, it, it's interesting you say that, Joe, because I, I, I can't echo that enough. I, I think that I see a lot of times people are saying wellness programs, and you're right. They think about a walking challenge. They think about a, you know, a biggest loser contest or whatever it may be. And, and, and in my mind, I think we can all agree on that. It's not so much about el- uh, wellness as it is. I mean, you could say wellness, but it's really about, you know, educational risk management, right? And when we say educational, what we're really talking about is educating a consumer, because I think we can all point to scenarios where if you're educated on a topic, whether it be car buying, whether it be buying a house, whether it be, you know, and you really ingrain yourself into learning more about what you know and what the end result could be, that educational component is huge. And I think it's all encompassing, right? And it it has to do with um, 
you know, it could be as much as choosing a provider based on readmission rates rather than, you know, the price. It could be, I mean, it could be the pharmacy that you choose or whatever it is. So I think when we talk about safety programs or other initiatives and in companies, it's really educational, right? And that education leads to a better result. You know, I'm sure, Chris, sorry, I'm stealing your thunder. No, this is great. This is great, guys. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people on the phone have, have heard this story, but I've told it for many years because I heard it many years ago. And it, to me, it's it's the best way to help people understand there's just so much more out there that people hadn't thought of. There's a company, and we all know this company, who went out and uh, surveyed all the hospitals in their area and found the highest rating, lowest cost facility in network within a certain mile radius to deliver a baby. And you know how you can write into your, not plan document, but into the SPDs that you can put steerage in there, which is a risk management strategy, right? You're not forcing anybody to do it, but if one of the employees or their spouses went and delivered a baby at one of the three hospitals, I forget what it was, that company then paid for diapers and wipes for a year for that employee. I mean, I, I would be having that conversation with my wife <laughs> to go and at least look at it, not forcing anybody, but yeah. when you look at the cost savings and now with the transparency data, slowly becoming available. You just have so much at the fingertips that can help drive costs um, outside of just the stop loss, just in the everyday claims that employers can start to take advantage of and try to flatten out overall year over year spend. And, and this is kind of the beautiful part, right? I'm, I'm in, I'm in a, such a wonderful position here being kind of surrounded by folks like you guys, right? You guys are so ingrained. You guys know this stuff, you know, like the back of your hand. But again, what I'm hearing, you know, when you guys are speaking, I hear about kind of, you know, the education of, of the end user and I'm hearing about impairment, right? Impairing management teams, impairing business owners, impairing the employees of the companies that join, you know, these medical stop loss group captives. It's, it's really powerful. Um, but I just want to kind of give, you know, the people listening and, and the people that are going to be watching the replays Right. If if there is, you know, if there's not a specific industry or geography that fits well, you know, what are some kind of guidelines of either size of companies or 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 talk to me a little bit about that, guys, of, of what does tend to work well with medical stop loss group captives? Right. Yeah. From from our perspective here at Captive Resources, we we've seen it all over the board. Uh, now, remember, when you're joining a group captive, you're transitioning if you're currently fully insured to self-funding or medical stop loss, us insurance nerds have four terms for one thing. So, um, <laughs> and that in and of itself has a bit of a size, uh, not restriction to it, but we try to stick with those guidelines. There aren't a lot of TPAs that go below really 40, some do, but we try to keep the minimum size in our group captives right now, or the CRI group captives to 50 employees on the plan. Yep. I think one of the misconceptions is, well, once you get over a thousand employees, they're too big for the program. We have groups 2000. We have a group that has 5,000 employees on the plan and it still works because their stop loss is such a small percentage of their spend relative to what they spend below their deductible. So they get more value out of coming and learning and hearing new ideas and frankly, sharing with everybody else what they've done that's innovative, that it still makes sense for them to be in the program. Now, if you get over 5,000, could there be other outlets? Yeah, I think so. But I really look at that good middle market. Everybody defines it differently, but I try to focus on anything from really 50 to 5,000, I think has a decent story and explanation as to why the captive would be a, a good fit. And we have different programs that fit different sizes too. I think that's important. Um, but I, I don't think the thousand is, is a good cap. I think it, it goes upstream from there still. You know, it, it's, it's funny, Joe. Uh, thinking back, if you would ask this question to us about two years ago, three years ago, maybe even a year ago, it's changing. That's what I'm seeing, right? 
We're seeing that there are program managers that there is a very underserved market that's going down to 25. Now that you've got eyes wide open when you get that low to your point, some of these third party administrators just you know, the amount of of work and process that needs to take to service a a group, they steer away from it because it's not real profitable for them, right? Yeah, Yeah, I get that. But at the same time, because what we're seeing in the market because of large claims, now we're starting to see these groups. And I always go back and think of the group that, you know, is 150 employees, right? And it used to be, I remember when I first started the business, it's like 100, that's the mark, Mm -hmm. you know, that's the mark to be self-insured, right? It's like this... This line drawn in the sand that like once you hit that, the the world opened up and you could become self-funded and go out and get an individual stop loss contract. Now, what's interesting is that being a hundred person individual self-funded account, not in a captive, there are because of the size of the claims that we're seeing, there's risk. Right. And you are on your own island. So now I'm starting to see these groups that are 400, 500 you know, and up thousand and further wanting to come back and look at a group captive strategy or a program that's more geared to folks that have been self-insured before because of the protection, right? So they're kind of swimming back to their friends a little bit and it makes sense. It makes sense with the carriers. It makes sense with the TPAs. And so if you ask me, Chris, from my standpoint, what I'm seeing 50 is kind of the number, mm-hmm. right, that we always put on there. Yeah, we're going to have some groups that are uh, that are smaller. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I have one group that has uh, 16 people in a group captive, and it's because the owner is in a casualty captive. He believes in it. He knows he's small. He knows the risk, but he wants that control, right? That he wants to have that ability to make changes. 50 kind of being the number. And then, but I I see that that the range, to Joe's point, is moving further up to larger and larger groups um, every day that goes by, every day. And I, I think a big part of that too is a, a captive is not a captive, right? If you've seen one captive, you've only seen one captive. There are different structures. There are different risk mechanisms, whether it's a pool, whether it's risk reward. And a lot of that plays into then what size element fits into the captive. So right. Jeff talking about a, a 16 life group, you know, depending on what deductible they've chosen, all plays into the dollars that have protection for them within the captive program. If it's risk reward, they've probably got a little more risk there at that size, more so than the reward side. So again, just because we're talking about it doesn't mean that out in the market, there isn't a fit for those smaller groups. There's just, you got to know the structure going into that captive program. Well, and and, and I kind of want to, you know, I want to talk about that a little bit, and I'm not going to get too far in the weeds or, or too specific with regard to captive resources. But, you know, it, a couple of things, you know, people always thought of, of captives as, as kind of alternative, obscure, right, kind of in the weeds. And, and, and that's no longer the case, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there was an article or, or a piece out, gosh, I think it was uh, uh, at some point last week talking about group captives aren't, you know, alternative anymore. They're becoming way more mainstream. They're being used a lot more. Um, you know, like you said, with, with some of the TPAs going below 50, you know, down to 16, right? And that's based on the risk tolerance, right, uh, of the business owner. Um, but there was another point in there that I just want to highlight, Jeff. I don't even know if, you know if you know you did this, but you talked about a rather large group, right, that was that was self-insured that was going into the, the, the group captive model. And it, and it really has to talk about, about the dampening uh, uh, of the volatility, right? And that is a massive component for, for companies that are looking to try to model out, right? Or potentially increase what they call as predictability, right? It, so it serves a ton of purposes, right? Um, it does. So, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. No, I, I I think it's important because I think that there are groups that are large and because they're larger, there's, you know, that they, they have access to different point solutions, right? And then, but one of the things that I can tell you that our large clients and prospects are talking about is just risk, pressure, right? right. Pressure from, I mean, the other day I heard about a four, I heard about, well, more than heard about a $14 million claim, $14 million claim. And so what is an individual um, you know, owner of a company that's self-insured right now with 200 lives, 
What are they going to do with a $14 million claim? And then and inherently, what's the next year going to look like with that stop loss carrier, right? So, you know, the difference is, uh, you know, I, I indicated you're on your own island, you're self-funded, you're buying your own individual stop loss contract. And then you have that uh-oh year, which is going to happen, right? You're going to have that uh-oh. The problem is, is that the pressures and the uh-ohs that are coming are bigger and badder than they've ever been. We haven't even talked about specialty medications, which everybody heads are spinning about and really don't know what to do with. But we've got, on the flip side, we've got these big claims, but we have things from a medical technology standpoint that are saving people's lives and improving their quality of life, which we, we can't ignore. We can't ignore that. Um, so I think, you know, that's what it's interesting. The conversation has started like I like what I'm doing, but I feel a little bit exposed and I want some more sustainability. So when I when I when I think of a captive, I always say transparency or a group captive setting. I think of transparency and I think of predictability and I think of sustainability. So three things that I think of which are, are solid. I think if any business owners putting their head on a pillow at night, those are three thoughts from a business perspective that's going to help them get a good night's sleep, no matter what they're doing, right? And I think just from a captive perspective, it speaks to the importance of a true partner from a reinsurance and front perspective. Mm -hmm. So just looking at it from, from our captives, the CRI captives, you know, Berkeley, I, it's not a secret, Berkeley's been one of our fronting carriers on two of the captives for one, for 13 years, right? And that has allowed us to build up a lot of good grace and watch how they've performed from a reinsurance perspective over a long period of time. And the captive knows if that $14 million claim comes knocking, Berkeley's not going to turn on the captive and say, well, we don't want you guys anymore. And here's the massive right. increase, go somewhere else. So that relationship side from a captive perspective with those partners, and we can define partners however you want it to be, is incredibly important. Um, I've received questions. I do the renewal every year. You know, why don't you guys go out and shop the captive every year? Well, that defeats the purpose of building that relationship. So when things hit the fan, you've got your partner there to make sure that everything sustains. That's part of that. You talked about volatility, Jeff. Dampening that is a huge piece of what a successful captive needs to do. And having that, everybody's got a different analogy for it, but having that good grace with a front over a long period of time is going to serve the captive well at some point. We just don't know when it's going to be, right? And that's part of well, health insurance. And that's important because, you know, boy, the landscape have changed on those fronting carriers as well, yeah. right? And um, I always say this, when you kind of get into the room of those that are you know, truly, truly involved in employee benefit captives from either a fronting standpoint or um, whatever financial standpoint, the room's not that big, right? And and because uh, for several reasons. Um, now, the good thing is, is that because of the, the, the velocity in which and the popularity in which group captives are growing, there are new people that are shining their light onto the area. And some are going to be really positive, right? They're going to come in and bring new ideas, new concepts, new new strategies, and that's that's welcome. Yep. Um, but you know, Joe, you couldn't be more right. Uh, having not all captives are the same, right? I think we said it best. They're not all the same, and I I love it when someone says, "Well, it's a captive." No, they're different, and 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 that's what we do, right? You know, um, Chris, you and I have talked about that. That's that's what we do. You know, right. what is the best fit? What you know, it's really diagnosing that client, not only their wants and needs, but what makes the most sense for them for several reasons. And they're not all the same. And um, we're seeing a lot of new, uh, Joe, I think you've seen a lot of new captive managers pop up, right? Um, you know, that are entering the market. And again, just speaking to, it's really speaking to what, you know, employers and business owners are wanting, and that is a better way to do it. You know, and, and a perfect example, I'll, I'll talk a little bit from the captive resources perspective for anybody who's known CRI for a long time, especially on the casualty side, all of our casualty captives are risk reward, right? And when we created our first three health captives, that's how we did them. We did risk reward health captives and there aren't a lot out there in the market, but those three have continued to grow and they've been very successful over a period of time. 
But as you talk about looking in the marketplace and looking at needs and wants from employer groups, you know, there are other structures out there that are outside of what, what we had done. And creating that structure is vitally important to be able to have something to offer back to those groups. So yeah, it's not just it's risk reward or it's pooled or it's pro rata share. Uh, there are different captive managers that are going to have or captive consultants that are going to have a lot of different options. And that education point, Jeff, back to what you said, that's why every captive people talk to, we all say we have to start with education. Mm -hmm. This is not buying insurance off of a spreadsheet. You have to have your eyes wide open, understanding what the mechan mechanism is, how it works, what it means to become an owner of a reinsurance company, meetings, how they function. I mean, there's a lot there more so than just saying that's the lowest stop loss price. Let's go with that. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I have heard in the market, we all kind of start the same way. Let's start with education. And it's a big piece right. of this captive world. Yeah. And, and, and just to kind of, you know, for, for the folks that are watching this, right. And, and those that aren't in, you know, a medical stop loss, stop loss group captive yet, there are different, you know, different vehicles for the folks that are coming from the fully insured world, right. For them to go into, they're not going to be able to go into a more of a risk reward uh, uh, mechanism potentially in the beginning, right. There's ones that they're going to kind of step into and, and kind of get into the world. So I would just ask folks that, you know, don't don't discount uh, looking into this. Right. Pick up the phone. Let's have a conversation. Uh, it might be a good fit now. Maybe we, we need to do some things to get you ready for it. But let's pick up the phone and let's have that conversation because there's a lot of education. There's a lot of impairment that goes into this. Um, and I want to kind of use a, a segue that Jeff had thrown out when when. You know, he, he was talking about specialty drugs and and some other technologies that are going on. And I'm going to try to share my screen here. I hope this goes right. But one of the things that I want to do, I, I hope this is OK. It's not meant to shock and, and, and ruin people's day. But uh, there was a, a white piece or white paper put out by Berkeley that, that Joe's mentioned that talks about uh, it's titled Cell and Gene Therapy State of the Market. OK, so let's I'm going to try to share my screen here. I hope this goes well. Um, let's see how this goes here. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yep. All right. So again, this came out, uh, only within the past, uh, about three months or so. Right. And I just want to kind of show some of these numbers here really quickly of, of some of the recently approved drugs, right? You've got cell therapy and gene therapy drugs. Um, again, Joe and Jeff, can you guys see my screen? Okay. Here. Yeah. OK, so we can see these numbers over here on the right that I'm kind of, you know, hovering my mouth mouse over. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you guys read off some of these numbers really quickly to the folks that might not be able to see those numbers? I see you trying to get me heartburn. Today? I see three and a half million. That's the one I'm going to read off. Three and a half million. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's um, I, I, I presume that's per dose or, or per treatment. Right. Yeah. For hemophilia. Yeah. 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 And we've got another one for 3 million, one per 2.8 million. And again, these are recently approved drugs, right? For gene therapy, cell therapy. Um, so, and, and, and the, the reason why I'm showing this is to kind of say to people or, or get them to think we need to become more proactive, right? And, and find ways of getting more control over what's going on in the world, right? These are great things for our employees and their family members and, and what could potentially happen to people medically. These are, these have great benefits and we need to be able to pay for these, right? It goes back to the risk financing, right? How do we finance these without bankrupt, bankrupting a company? Now I'm going to ruin everyone's day a little bit more potentially, but I'm going to scroll down to some potential um, solutions that are, uh, that are expected approvals this year. Okay. It's a pretty decent list. So we got more coming, right? And again, I'm not trying to ruin people's day, but what I'm trying to do is provide some, some transparency and some insight as to what's going on in the world and these impacts that are going to be uh, impacting on companies' medical plans. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen, but I do want to get some thoughts from Joe and, and Jeff on, on some of these cell and gene therapies that are coming our way. 
Yeah, I'll give my real quick thought, Jeff, and then obviously from your guys' perspective, you yeah. probably see it a little more often. You know, this gets back to the like-minded nature of, of being in a group captive. In my opinion, if, if groups are making the decision to take that leap, they have inherent qualities about themselves and about their company that everybody else does, right? They probably care about their employees. They want to do its best. They want to control their spend. So they're not moving, you know, the programs around and passing costs down to the employees. Now, what I've seen and where the struggle comes in for companies like that is a lot of them being very paternalistic also want to make sure that they're helping their employees and their families. And everything you just showed, Chris, is life-changing. Mm -hmm. And the dilemma becomes, how does a company afford a three and a half million dollar drug or the impact that could come from that to save an employee who they feel that paternal, paternalistic instinct to? And, and that's that's really the dilemma and the conversation that we've seen kind of take shape within within the captive dynamics. And I, I don't think there's a one size fits all solution yet. And I'm sure there isn't. Um but again, when you talk about the power of a group captive to be able to have conversations with others going through that same thing and finding solutions and finding outlets, that's something that might go unseen if you just jump right into the numbers of a captive. Oh, you're not competitive from a stop loss perspective. Why? Because it's 3% high. I mean, there, there's so much more that goes on outside of just the number side. And I think that even though it's scary to look at and we hear about it all the time, I think that really highlights part of that. It's, it's what's keeping every underwriter up at night right now. Right. I mean, it, it, I mean, look, you know, Chris, you're putting numbers out there, these drugs and they're doing wonderful things. Right. Interesting part was, is I was at a meeting last week and I got to, to interact with someone that's in the specialty space, um, really acts as a specialty consultant. And what's interesting is, is I think we're going to start seeing some clarity coming to this. Right now, all the stop loss carriers are like, you know, let's get a solution for this. You know, th th that was the first thing that says, we got to figure out a way to solve this. And then when you look at how these large ones, and you, if you saw the number above them, how often they happen in the population, they're not as evident as you think they are, right? And so right now, a lot of the stop loss carriers are saying, look, we can take the $2 million, $3 million hit, right? When they, when you're seeing a pipeline, though, behind that of what's coming, then the conversation starts moving forward. And now it's not only a handful or 10 drugs that are out there and approved or, or 50 drugs, whatever it is, then it becomes 100 and then 150 and more, so, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, some of these drugs. I mean, if you can take someone who's a hemophiliac and solve that problem, you're ultimately going to be saving money in the long run, right? No question about that, if it can solve that problem. So the interesting part is, as I go back to think about organ transplants. So if we kind of take this path the same way, right? Organ transplants. Um, gosh, I can remember as a kid, you know, hearing about, you know, the very first, you know, when, or, when heart transplants started happening, what a big deal that was. And get how getting approved as a facility to get a heart transplant was there were only a few of them and now there are several of them across the country that are doing actual transplants you know kidneys livers hearts eyes skin you know other tissue right and so then what happened in the in the insurance industry or not in the insurance industry but in the healthcare industry is a better statement is we started seeing these centers of excellence mm -hmm. And when they wake up in the morning and they put their pants on and tie their shoes, that's what they do. And they do it well and they do it efficient. So the interesting thing that I think we're going to start seeing is centers of excellence revolved around specialty medications and gene therapy medications. The interesting part is, is that not every physician, you know, you really have to go and get to a healthcare provider that understands this. And I'll give you my example about Zelgensma. It was touted as the one and done, Right. I'm sure that someone maybe watching this could debate it, but what I am hearing is that the success rate is, is not nearly as high as once thought it would be. And what's happening is that one, two million, $2.3 million drug, whatever you want to frame that the cost is, you get that drug. And, and, and Joe, to your point, that paternal instinct of, you know, how do you look at an employee and whose child needs this drug that could change their life and say no, right? 
right? So I always say to make myself feel better, there's my economic mind and then there's my sensitive mind. So don't frame me as not being sensitive to someone's condition. <laughs> there's an economic conversation to it too. But what in this particular case, you know, the drug didn't work. The backup drug that started being used, which has been being used, is a $750,000 drug. That's number two in line mm -hmm. to this big hitter. So I think what we're going to see is we're going to see an ever-moving, changing response from the industry, but I think we're going to see a mapping in of truly centers of excellence um, that, again, what they do when they wake up, this is what they do. And then there's going to be I don't want to call it a gatekeeper, but there's going to be more thoughtfulness to pre-qualifying those that, you know, instead of just trying it because, oh, let's give it a shot. There's going to be uh, a little bit more rules and a little bit more guardrails put around these things. So one thing that I can say in my, you know, 24 years of experience, when there's a problem, there's usually a lot of people that are coming up uh, with a response. Right. And, and and not a response to say no, but a response to do it better and build efficiency. So I think we're just on the climb of that mountain to do that. And it was really eye opening from that meeting I had last week to say, yeah, these are drugs that are out there. And Chris, what you didn't show is all the other drugs that are in the pipeline that we're seeing between twenty five and one hundred thousand dollars, which we kind of, you know, we kind of just oh, it's a it's a hundred. Yeah, it's a hundred thousand Tell me when we get up to about 500,000 and I'll get interested, right? Yeah. That is a weird thing to say because it wasn't the case three, four years ago, right? right? Um, we're starting to see drugs that were developed in the 50s that are coming back out um, being used for other conditions today. Matter of fact, a lot of these drugs are starting to be crossed over into other conditions. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is a lot of these drugs that were developed in the past are still highly effective for a lot of people's chronic illnesses. Yeah. So it's an ever mapping, ever changing. But Joe, to your point, um, you got to have a conversation around it. Right. And I always say it's not that that we want to prevent. We don't want to prevent people from taking these drugs. We want the right drug for the right price in the right location. Right. That's kind of the three point solution when we look at delivering these high, high dollar drugs. And I, I think if you take it back to just the general stability and strength of a group captive conversation, too, it speaks to the the importance of a a, a properly underwritten group captive. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to what I've talked about earlier, that longevity and, and partnership with a fronting carrier as well, because if, if I look at the group captives that we've seen and, and helped create, you know, using somebody like Berkeley, just because you pulled up their study and then looking at one of the larger group captives as one kind of large company underneath their umbrella. Yeah, they can absorb a three and a half million dollar claim, but the captive's reinsurance loss ratio up above the captive layer is still going to be somewhere in the 60 to 70 percent range. And, and that's important because that then Berkeley is profitable. I'm using Berkeley. It could be anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want in a good partnership. But they don't always have to come back then and penalize that one group for that one instance that was somewhat out of their control. And I know we're talking about drugs. It could be anything. It could be a premature. Baby. Right. But as, as claim dollars continue to rise having well underwritten the right groups coming into a captive and a majority of those groups outperforming adds chris what i think you said kind of that layer of protection to still help stabilize over the long period of time because you're not on that island it's no longer them having to come back and try to get money from you your insurance company your reinsurance company performs well in their eyes even though you had a bad claim See, Joe, you, you went exactly to where, I mean, uh, maybe it was kind of coming across my huge forehead here, but my thoughts as you guys were speaking is, you know, the, these these claims, these incidences, right, right, the, the, um, the, the baby, the hemophiliac, right, that's going to happen in the fully insured, it's going to happen in the self-insured, it's going to happen anywhere along the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. But what, I would say, risk financing, what mechanism, what setup gives you the best probability of or, or or the best way to cope economically right with with what happens right 
And, and I think we can all agree when something like this happens in a fully insured situation, right? The year that it happens, right? Yeah, it's, it's the risk is transferred away, but it's going to be economic pain, not just for one year, but for several years. And, and Jeff, I'm take I'm going to steal this line from you. When an increase after those years, right, you're going to see that that 40 percent increase. And I'm just pulling these numbers out. Now that line in the sand has is, is, is been established. New line in the sand, right? There's now a new line. It's not going down. You do not have that chance to recoup, to reset. Uh, you don't have the chance, and, and I'm giving away a little bit of, a, of the stuff here, but you don't have a chance at, at an underwriting profit in two years from now when the group performs better. You've now entered a new era. There's no going backwards. So talk to us a little bit, a bit about that, guys. That's the new normal, right? That's what I call it, the new normal. Yeah. And it's pain for the sins of the past, right? Yeah. And we all know as a, as a business owner, your group changes, your demographics changes, your, 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 you know, you could geography could change, whatever it could mean. Right. So I always say this, what I feel like uh, when I'm talking to prospects and clients about group captives, I just want a chance to win. I want to have a chance to win. I think we could all go back and tell stories about whether it be sporting events or whether it be taking a test or whatever it may be walking in there and just feeling like you didn't have a chance. Right. And I think that's one of the beautiful things that, you know, one, being self-insured and two, being in a group captive and having friends is that you have a chance to win. You have you have a response. And I think that's what's led us to this conversation, especially, you know, traditionally, again, we indicated we've seen probably more movement from fully insured to, to, to group captives. I think we're starting to see an equal response coming from the employers that are larger for different reasons, but they're all kind of working towards just being a better version of themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's a response. You can have a response. And how can you have a response or make any decision in your business if you have a lack of transparency or control? So I always kind of say, you know, I use the analogy of take a fully integrated, um, you know, fully insured plan, not to say a double, but take a fully insured plan and hit it over the head with a hammer. Right bust it apart and then go back to the lab and put it together in a way that's that that it can adapt right that's what a group captive allows you to do it creates those levels of security those levels of risk management and um but no chris you're right i've talked about it a million times uh, you know you set a new normal and um you got to get yourself into an environment where you have a chance to, to flush the system and you have a chance to improve and 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 use the new point solutions to help address that cost. Yeah. And, you know, Joe, I'll give you one second, but I just want to kind of throw, you know, to, to, to the folks that are still fully insured. And this is, these are my words. Right. But I always like to kind of say, listen, as you said, you know, instead of taking the hammer right and breaking it apart and going back to the lab, let's unbundle everything. Right. Let's unbundle all the different parts that are in that very currently opaque closed box where you're getting nothing coming out of it, right? No data, right? The only thing you're getting is that the cost of that box goes up every year, probably more than your sales are, right? Unfortunately, right now. Um, how do we open that box, takes the box apart, take all the pieces out? And oh, by the way, when you unbundle everything, you can you can pull pieces out, mix and match. You can take a TPA here. You can take a uh, a specialty carve out, right? You can you can switch these pieces up on a year by year basis. Not to say that I recommend that, right? But you have the optionality. Okay. Now, by doing that, right, we're also going to be stripping out, you know, the, the carrier profit, and, and and in some instances, right, the, the state taxes, right. So it, it, you're going to get a benefit right off the bat. But I want to I want Joe, if you could. Right. So we're going to look to stabilize costs. We're going to look to reduce volatility. But talk to us a little bit about kind of the return of underwriting profit potential. Talk to us a little bit about that, Joe. Yeah. And that goes back, Chris, to the differences in how captives are structured. So a captive is not a captive. Right. When we talk about increases, if you get a 20 percent increase fully insured. That's just, you know, what you're paying times that 20 percent increase in self-funding. Just in the traditional market, you pay a premium and you fund your claims below that deductible. Typically, that premium's probably 20% of your overall spend. The other 80% are just your everyday claims, which get back to the control and managing that risk. 
but a 20% increase just on 20%, not nearly as painful as, as the fully insured world. Mm -hmm. The captive model, and yes, you might be getting, we're just using a 20% increase because of whatever is going on. But typically what we have seen is about 60 to 65% of that is seeded back to those captive members for their claims next year in the captive layer. We call it a loss fund. Some people, you know, use it as a pool. There, there's different terminology. But those unused dollars are no longer profit for the carrier. They're not capped by the captive insurance company. They're returned back to those individual members in the form of a dividend. So one of the programs, our, our longest standing captive, has closed 10 underwriting years and returned back $35 million dollars in what we call dividends back to those member companies. Those are underwriting dollars that were not used for their claims in the captive that then flow back to them, right? That would have been 35 million in carrier profit just in its simplest form. And the question I always get is, well, you know, what did the front and carrier underwrite to to have that much profit? The captive loss ratio is still 93 to 101%. Mm -hmm. So, the, the goal of the captive is to make sure that a it's underwritten correctly and when groups go and outperform for whatever reason it might be they now have the ability to get their dollars back and you know jeff and i have used analogies i'm going to use one more i think of it as the backyard volleyball game right you are going to serve you are going to have that bad claim that gives you that bad year and it's one in four, one in five, knock on wood. It could be one in eight if you have a good streak, right? But you're going to rotate around and then it's going to be your turn to serve again. But we've talked about it at length, having that protection of the program. And in those other years, getting some of those dollars back as dividends and distributions is, is a small piece to why group captives have become very successful. Yeah. And, and, and I kind of want to tie in something you were talking about also, right? Because people will say, you know, sometimes someone will say, well, well, gosh, when, you know, when I have that one in five or one in six, one in seven shock loss year, right? What happens, right? Well, let's say, okay, in the captive model, it's going to be spread out, right? Because there's, there's, let's say, you know, there, there's my layer, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say Jeff's in the captives, right? Then there's Jeff's layer, right? The, the captive layer. And then Joe, you're the, you're Berkeley, then there's your layer. So we've got three layers that are going to be absorbed in these losses, right, above the spec deductible, right? So you've got multiple ways of, of kind of smoothing out these, you know, these impacts. Um, and, and again, going back to, you know, the 20, you know, just to use round numbers, right? Let's say if a, if a company spend is a million dollars, right? In, in a fully insured world, a 20% increase, right, is going to be about, what, $200,000, yep. okay? Now, a 20% increase on just the stop loss, which is only 20% of the overall spend, right? You're looking at what? $40,000. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real difference mathematically. Nothing changes right on, on the, the, the treatment, right? That, that the employer or the employee's family receives. It's just how on the unbundling of everything works. Well, and that's one of, it, I've talked a little bit about misconceptions of the captive. We, we talked about a captive being kind of the financial mechanism for the C-suite, the presidents, the CEOs, CFOs. One of the things I've heard a lot is, well, the captive is going to go and change everything that we do from our employees' perspective. Not really the case. I mean, you can change it. You talked about unbundling, which is great. But really, the captive at its core is a financial mechanism. If I look down and look at my ID card, it says Cigna on it. It doesn't say anything about the captive name or who the stop right. loss carrier is. I know what I pay for my co-pays for my family, my out-of-pocket maximums. That's insurance. The end users don't care and shouldn't care about the captive mechanism, right? It, it just doesn't matter. Right. And, you know, and, and this is funny. So, you know, I as we create, I created an agenda going into this one. And one of my bullet points was, right, initial benefits, right? And I'm, I'm talking about stabilizing costs and, and reducing volatility and providing more predictability. But what I've heard from, from you know, current members of, of the medical stop loss is that's what might get them into it. Mm 
-hmm. But once they're in, it's these follow on benefits that greatly <laughs> outweigh the financial. Right. And I can see you guys kind of nodding your head. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, some of the things I wrote down here, right. You know, it's, it's, you know, the, the HRM, you know, the, the, the sharing of best practices, right. The, the cost control, you know, during the pandemic, you know, members of the group captives huddled together and shared ideas and thought leadership. So talk to us a little bit about that, Joe and uh, uh, Jeff. Yeah, the the cap uh, the medical stop loss group captives that that I have overseen and, and built have 98 percent retention year in and year out. And rarely, I mean, over 10 years, maybe once or twice, has it been they just want a different insurance outlet. Companies go out of business, private equity gets involved. Right. buy sell um, you don't see many groups leave these structures and it's not just captive resources structure it's really all medical captives i've seen just have great retention because of that piece yes the financial aspect is a lot of what gets them in the door um, and again based on that education you want to talk about the benefits that members get from the sharing, the networking, <clears throat> the ad hoc committees, everything that happens kind of behind the scenes. But until a group actually goes to those meetings, until they get involved in an ad hoc committee, until they leave a meeting with seven pages of notes of things they may not have heard before, it's really hard for them to find that value. But once they do, they it's something that kind of trumps that 20% of spend, right? We've seen groups get increases on the stop loss, but still have a lower overall spend year over year because they've implemented strategies here and there that have helped the employees choose better paths or whatever the case may be. They got a large drug off the plan. So to me, there, there are a lot of benefits of the captive, the member owned, the distribution, but if folks are not talking about the aspect of controlling overall spend, inclusive of all of those everyday claims, then that's really missing the boat of what partnering with like-minded groups is all about. Right. It's That's right up my alley. So going into captive step one, it's a big hurdle. It's a leap of faith for a lot of people because it's different than what they've ever seen. The real work starts once you get into a captive. Because then you have, again, to Joe's point, we've talked about a transparency and control. You can start seeing how things are moving and you can see inefficiencies and it's amazing what you can find. Number one, I can't tell you how many groups that come from fully insured. They, they, they look at a captive and you say rebates and they're like, what's a rebate? <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, let me tell you what rebates are. And, you know, I, I think it's a conversation I have all the time. It's like, going shopping, right? Look, look how much money I said. The goal is not to get to maximize your rebates. But the point is, is there is a solution. There's not a solution. There is a grab back or a way to pull back some of your money through your pharmacy spend that you never had a chance to do before that the carriers were keeping on their own, right? Number one. And then that opens up a whole nother host of other, of other opportunities and discussions. And it's like when you open a door and see an opportunity, you go to another door and open up another opportunity. And it can, what my groups are doing today versus, you know, what they were doing five years ago in a captive are completely different. But we can do that. I mean, we're talking about specialty medications, right, Chris, and the cost. But on the other side, why don't we talk about some of the stem cell therapies that are being done to prevent people from having, you know, ace, you know, having repairs and surgeries that are, you know, multi, you know, tens of thousands of dollars more. So there are technologies that are coming out and more to be expected that are going to improve upon, right? I mean, you know, um, mammograms and x-ray technology that's being done portably now and you know in these villages you know across north america i mean there's amazing things that are happening so i always say getting to the captive and getting to the structure very important yeah. and, it, and it's from there on what you can do to drive and and how the eyes open and joe to your point my personal book of business over 10 years 100 retention now i conveniently don't include the three groups that left because one got too small, one got bought out by a top five accounting firm and one um, private equity investment. 
So to, to it just checked right into yeah, I add the, I add those in there. So my ninety eight percent was a little more okay. true than just a hundred. <laughs> okay, so I'm ninety. So I'm ninety five percent. The, the data is okay. key. The data. Yeah, yeah. Key. It, it's the transparency in the unbundling. It's just inherent in, in everybody right. here in the in the captives vertical right, right. In, the, in the group captive space. But and not to beat a dead horse here, but all I keep hearing is just impairment. Right when when you can take a. Um, a business owner, management, right? A CFO, C a CEO, and you talk to them about things that they might not be aware of or, or different methods or, or ways of financing. That to me is huge, right? And then when when the HR folks and, 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 and the employees can benefit, right? Mm -hmm. from, from once they enter yeah. to, to going forward, that's, that's equally as important also. Now we're at the kind of the hour and five mark. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the queue, which I do want to address, right? I'm going to have to hold back a ton of these, but I do want to kind of throw out a couple of these to, to Joe and Jeff. Um, the first one that, that we have here is um, we just renewed. Do we have to wait till our next renewal to join a captive resources group captive? Joe, I'll, I'll let you kind of tackle that one. Well, so I'll, I'll actually let Jeff tackle it, but from our okay. perspective, you know, it, it depends on how you're funded, right? There, there's a lot that goes into that. If you're fully insured or self-funded, there's, there's different moving mechanisms, right? So talk to your uh, medical consultants, your brokers to, to really find that out. From our perspective, we'll write groups into any of these group captives um, at any point in the year. Group captives have a common anniversary date related to stop loss. So for us and for the captives, it's about short contracts and long contracts that first year to wrap them to that common anniversary date. Uh, outside of that, you, you've got to talk to the, the Chris's and the Jeff's of the world to see if there's any penalties, any, you know, do you have claims accruing to your deductible? You, you probably right. don't want to move mid-year. If, if that's the case, if you're fully insured, you've got a little more flexibility. I would say it's never too early to start learning about captives, whether you just renewed or not. Have that conversation back to your point, Joe, education, right? Because there is there is a curve that, you know, um, and questions are going to come from those conversations. And to Joe's point, you know, from their standpoint, it's a, it's, it's a common contract date for reinsurance. But I will tell you, there are a lot of groups that will have a plan year that runs off cycle of the reinsurance renewal. And that's not a bad thing. Actually, Matter of fact, I think it's one of those situations where, you know, it's a constant view of where you are and it never runs away. So, um, so to my point is you just renewed. Great. Maybe take a deep breath. Don't know how your renewal was, but take a deep breath. Maybe relax for a little bit. You know, when I say a little bit, a couple weeks or a month, whatever it may be. And then, you know, learn more, learn more about it. So then when it does get close, because the other function, Joe's handling the, the medical stop loss side. The other thing that's important is if you're coming from fully insured, you got to choose a TPA and there are other decision points that need to be made along the way. And there's a go, no go point yep. that, you know, you get close to too far past that go, no go point. You're going to have a horrible ride. So there, there's a lot more to the conversation there. And, and, and that kind of that's another question that we got, you know, someone asked, you know, we're fully insured. Can we switch midterm? So I think you just kind yeah. of address that also. But it does seem like there are folks out there that are that are either not sure how this works. Right. Or, or feel like, oh, I just missed it. Now, it, it, there's always time to have a yeah. conversation. Right. Uh, um, but with that being said, it's not in, in someone's best interest potentially to, to jam something in just to jam it in. Right. This is a well, long-term relationship that we're looking to start. We're looking to start it off on the right foot. You know, recently working with a group in Tennessee, we found out like they love the idea of a captive. They're in a property casualty captive. They want to be in an employee benefits captive, but they weren't ready. And I think that's the most important thing is that sometimes you're ready for a captive and then you need to have an advisor that can get you captive ready. Yeah. And, and, and that can mean a lot of different things, right? right? We, we've educated groups, you know, in in a couple of weeks we've educated groups over three four years so mm -hmm. it's it, each group's going to be different again we've talked about it there's a lot to get your hands around to understand really what they are how they work a captive's not a captive so there are nuances to each one that make them different and 
it, it's a really hard thing to try to figure out on the back end. So even though you just renewed, if you start the education process now, you're not really looking at numbers through that process. You're trying to gain understanding of what are the mechanisms? What is my commitment? Are there mandatory or best practice requirements? Every captive just operates so different. Right. Well, and quite frankly, Joe, do you have the internal structure to handle what needs to be done, yeah. right? I mean, there's, there's that. And, and so I think that's a lot of the biggest determinants. Like, can we be self-funded? Yes, you can. Um, <laughs> again, it's, it, 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 look, it can look intimidating on the surface, but when you really break it down, you know, yes, you can, but you, you're right. There's a lot of time spent on more than just, you know, the mechanism, the, a look at the organization and look at, you know, look at it, your beliefs and your goals. I mean, those are important. Yeah. A captive, a, a member owned group captive is not going to fit every group. I'll, I'll be the first one to say it. Uh, and that's fine. That's okay. But it's the education piece that's going to help you explore that. Right. And, and so another question here, and, and Joe, you kind of touched on this a little bit, right? So, and this is a little bit vague and broad, but it says, we like our insurance company. Can we keep that? Right. I know you mentioned it. Again, yeah, every, 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 yeah, every, right? every captive is going to be a little different um, depending on state, depending on your size, depending on a lot of functions. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're already self-funded, then odds are, you don't have to move a whole lot because what you're doing is replacing uh, the stop loss carrier. One of the misconceptions, again, I hear is, well, we went to such and such TPA and they won't work with the captive name or they won't work with captive resources. They don't. The TPA's direct relationship is still with the stop loss carrier and the captive reinsures that stop loss carrier, at least in our setups. So we're agnostic when it comes to TPAs and PBMs, as long as they can work with, again, those fronting carriers of the captives. Now, over a long period of time, we've found good partners in the marketplace that, you know, obviously the, the relationship between a consultant like, like you all and us is important and we can help with those conversations. But the captives in and of themselves right now, as long as the, as the TPA will allow it, allow the it, the group to be self-funded and as long as they will work with that stop loss carrier the captive is is kind of a non-issue to them got it got it well at this point we're kind of getting close to the hour and 15 mark you know as i as i said to you guys kind of it, it doesn't take much to kind of fill up an hour um we've gone over that which is which is great um but before we kind of close out today i do want to thank our panelists here you guys did a terrific job um, you guys really crushed it. Uh, there's so much more to talk about here. We could probably go on for hours. So again, I just want to relate to folks that, that if there's anything we talked about that intrigues you, reach out, anything you, you want to have a conversation, let's talk. Uh, but I do want to thank everyone online for attending. Uh, I hope this has been educational, beneficial to everyone. As a reminder, the recording of this session will be available for replay in about a day or so. With that said, everyone have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. guys.